What a great opening to a programme, eh? The reason why you saw the logo uh, disappearing into the distance there is because I'm in Italy at the moment. I'm sitting on the bed in the hotel room. And uh, the first three programmes of Visualise are all going to be on tape, which means that we get back to the studio just like last year by July 17th this year. Anyhow, the reason we're here is to see you two and to check out you two. So first thing I'm going to do is check out the roof. Heavy uh, rock and roll sunshine vibe here. Right, where are we? We're up on the roof. And I see beside me here on the right-hand side one fan who most likely will not get a ticket for the concert at the weekend, just like thousands of others who won't either. For those who do get tickets for the concert, it's something they've been waiting for for a long time. And they're not the only ones who've been waiting to see you two, because with the, all the media attention that goes with you two and has gone with them in the States, they've taken this over to Europe as well. And in Europe, they've decided to start by playing two separate venues in Italy. First one is Rome, and the second one is a small town just northeast of Bologna, which is called Modena. And here it is beside us here. Now, they play in a football stadium away over there on the far side. And when I say that it's not just the fans that want to see you 2 it's also the local dignitaries, because wherever you 2 play, media attention is focused on that place big time. And they know that as well as everybody else does. So the first thing they want to do is not just meet you 2 not just see the concert, not just get autographs of their sons and daughters, but they also want to offer you two the freedom of the city. And that's exactly what the Lord Mayor and the local dignitaries have done this time around in Modena. She wants to thank you because we came to her city. She prepared you a present and that she thinks that you are very, very good. And she's very pleased that your songs uh, are so deep and... Um, and <laughs> What did you get presented with and why? Um, I'll find out later. And why? Because she wanted to meet us. Do, do you get used to this sort of thing? Because like, you got the keys to the city in Las Vegas, right? And you, you, you get the sort of freedom of the city in some places in America. Yeah. I mean, like, does this mean an awful lot to you? Uh, well, it's, it's definitely an honor, wherever you are, to, to meet the mayor, you know? We met Charlie last time we came home. That was a bit of a <laughs> scam. Well, do you have a good fun on the road these days now, seeing as you're obviously so protected from the crowd in a lot of ways? It's not as loose as it was years ago. Can no. you still have a good laugh? Well, you can, because uh, there are those times where you can just, you know, break from the routine and go off and do something different. Yeah. Well, leaving uh, Meadowlands a few weeks ago, I stopped the car and just climbed out, because it was so late, like, there were only about 50 people outside. Just had a chat with them for about half an hour and climbed back in the car. So it's not as it's not as bad as it might appear. Do you know where you are all the time and do you know what you're doing? <laughs> this is like, for instance, if it's today, it must be Northern Italy. Is that it? Or? It gets a bit like that sometimes, but of, of late, actually, it's not been too bad. What was really bad was when we were doing theatre tours and it's literally it was every day we were in a new town. And because of the size of this uh, production, it takes like a couple of days to set up. In fact, we've got two productions, one speeding on to the next town while we're here. So. Uh, generally, it's, the schedule's not too, too bad. At this stage, we've got another full 12 months of touring ahead of us. And some of that is committed, some of it is under discussion. Um, and I basically make those plans with the band, and then the organization, at any given time, is advancing all those shows. You know, yeah. um, The shows that we'll be doing in 12 months' time are in some sort of stage of preparation even now. And that, has, that work has to go on even as we are performing the shows like tonight. Yeah, yeah. We've got a fairly comprehensive production office, more than any other band has. By the fax machine, we're in constant touch with the U2 Dublin office, the U2 American office. We're in constant touch with the, the different agencies, both Waste of Talent and Premier Talent, with the accountants, with um, the different promoters in each different country. They fax us venues and sites and plans and layouts. We fax them back what we want, we email to them what we want. So are you working here in this office in relation to future European shows, not just for these Italy shows here? Are these Italy shows done? We're in America. <laughs> like two years ago you played your gig in Crow Park, right? but this yeah. time around it's two biggies at Crow Park. Yeah. So I mean, like, do you feel any different than you did two years ago, knowing the success and the publicity you've had since America? Not really, no, we're still warming up for Crow Park, you know, we were warming up the last time we did. Um, obviously, it's a different jam, I mean, the fact that it's two nights and, you know, there's been a lot of a lot of talk about the band and all that sort of things, but, you know, it's, it's only rock and roll, you Do you know? think there's the too much, well, thing. if it's only rock and yeah, roll, then, do you the think there's been too much sort of emphasis on the sort of you 2 as, as saviours? Yeah, or absolutely, all this? I mean, you know, that's, that's the periphery, I mean, obviously it's important, the band does say things, but especially in America, I think they make an awful lot, you know, just... 
far, make far too much of that side of the band. I mean, you know, at the end of the day, it's rock and roll. That's what it does. And for people to come along and jump up and down, that's what it's all about, you know? Stage. This is the third open air gig you played. You played Rome. This is the second one in Muddy now. So how different is this to America? Um, they're a home crowd, Dave. <laughs> they're a home crowd. Uh, it, you know, it was an away game, but they were a home crowd, Dave. And then the lads give hundred percent. Hundred percent on and off the field, Dave. On and off the field. I was sick as a parrot. No. <laughs> you're, you're not over the moon, yeah. No, it was, it was great. You know. Um, I've been eating Italian food all my life, as you know, you know, Macari and that. Isn't that as well, just, how's the mouth since the accident just before the gig in America, the first gig? Uh, you can folks sit there, uh, there. it's all right. Uh, they, they put about 12 stitches in me, uh, in my chin just there, but I don't know. If I was in Duran Duran, I'd be kicked out, I suppose. <laughs> Two years ago, you conquered the world with the unforgettable fire, but this is a bit more of a phenomenon now at this stage. So how do you feel coming home? You see, if you tell the truth, you look like you're not telling the truth. So, uh, well, I mean, it's, it's obvious, I and mean, we've said it before, it's, it, for us it's the most important. It's more important than America, or it's more important than, than you know, than England, or, or Italy, or anywhere. It's, it's where we live, and you don't want to fall flat in your face where you live, do you? Jacks are back. And what an all island we have for you tonight. Well, getting back to the music and specifically Crow Park over the weekend, now those gigs will have Lou Reed and Big Audio Dynamite and the Pretenders and Light a Big Fire and whatever. Do you sit down and consciously decide which bands you want? Oh yeah. A lot of thought goes into those bills and we've we've tried very hard to get great acts on, on the bill. Um, the two shows in Crow Park will have completely different sort of supporting casts because obviously there are a lot of people who come both days and I think they're entitled to see two diff different shows. Yeah. Um, also, it's, it's an opportunity to, if you like, exercise your own taste. We all have, you know, the, a lot of the other bands playing with us are friends of ours and, and make music that we've admired over the years. Having Lou Reed open for you too is, is I mean, it seems... If, if anyone had told us in 1979 yeah, exactly. that Lou Reed would be opening for us in Croke Park, I mean, what would we have said? What would you have said? Well, if anyone had told you in 1979 that you'd be on top of the American charts in the one week with a single and an album and that, I mean, what would you have said? Oh, well, that wouldn't... I, I would have said, yes, we will be, yes. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was no... that was no surprise. <laughs> Frank Sinatra then, what was that like with Gregory Peck standing up and cheering you and everything? Oh, Gregory Peck was amazing. Gregory, Gregory Peck just looked down at me like that and he just went, where are you, wh where are you from? And I said, um, I'm from uh, Dublin, Ireland. He said, I'm from Kerry, the most beautiful county in all of Ireland. It was straight out of, you know, whatever, those, you know, all those old Irish, ah. What are you talking about asking questions like that for? <laughs> Well, 
here in Medina, there are quite a few similarities between, say, a concert like in Italy as there is in Ireland. Uh, for instance, a football stadium where the gig has been played. But, of course, the capacity is a lot less than it is in Crow Park. And over two nights, there'll be about oh, 35, 40,000 each night. Now, the thing is that there are some differences, though. For instance, you can see that every time a mess is made, it's cleared up immediately. There's people cleaning up immediately all of the time. And some of the things you're not allowed to take in seem to be quite different to other concerts. For instance, they take all plastic bottles as well as every other kind of bottle at the gate. They also take big books. They take um, binoculars. You can't bring a, uh, an umbrella in or anything like that. And you might think you need an umbrella, but there was a rain shower just earlier on. And the thing is then also, which is a surprising one, is that out on the pitch, there are people stopping you walking out on the pitch unless you're wearing runners or the equivalent of runners. And uh, if you're not wearing something like that, then they guide you back towards the sides or back up into the stands. So when you're in Italy, you've got to be very flexible with certain things. We're playing in soccer stadiums now, so they're very keen on their sport and their turf. So they don't like you sort of messing around on the field or playing, almost playing soccer on the field is out of bounds. Their soccer pitches are their, you know, be all and end all. Yeah. And we, we run wooden roads across the pitch to get our equipment to the mixing desks rather than just sort of turf them across and forklifts as we would normally do. Then tell us about the pitch in Crow Park now in Dublin over the weekend. The pitch in Crow Park. This year you're going to see a change in the pitch in Crow Park because the first time the GA have demanded it to be totally covered. Before they previously went in front of the mixed position up to the barricade, but uh, after the Simple Mind show in Dublin last year, it got a bit cut up and uh, the, G the Leinster branch of GA weren't too happy playing on this thing that looked like a ploughed field, yeah. which wasn't that bad in my opinion, but I can understand their concern for it. So this year, like, they've gone ahead and doing what they're doing in uh, Parky Cueve and Cork for Shimsha and yeah. cover the whole thing properly. Yeah. It makes it a lot easier to clean up and get out quicker and yeah. it's, it's, it's much more presentable. Plus, we're doing two shows there, so it's a lot easier to clean the tarp than it is to clean the grass. Yeah, right. Tell us about the famous drawer here with all the stuff because this is one of the most coveted and fought over things that are hidden in this drawer here what, what about them basically you just got a whole load of passes because you have to you know it's such a huge area it has to be controlled in some way you can't have every tom dick and harry running around backstage so we just have instigated this pass system which most bands have anyway um you've got about seven different gradings now and each different day each different color and everything else yeah we have to do that yeah I'll just give you a quick look Take us through a few of them. I mean, like, for instance, I've got one here which says uh, U2 VIP. This is, now, a, this is the famous VIP pass. This is for people who aren't necessarily working but need access around the arena or around the stadium, whatever. Stop short of letting into U2's dressing room. So everywhere else you can go with that one. Except U2's dressing room. Now, where is that? That's about the third in the scale of seven, is it? It's the second. It's the second, is it? So you're second in the scale of seven days. <laughs> so Bono is a better one than me, yeah? Well, absolutely. <laughs> I'm a better one than you, Dave. <laughs> we have obviously covered everything we can imagine um, that, that, that we need to, 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 to plan. The crew are, you know, the U2 road crew is now, has been for a long time, but they are absolutely world class. You know, they, um, they can run a show like this um, better than anyone else in the world. Yeah. And this is now the biggest show in the world. Yeah. As the world's number one live band, the requirements of sound, lights and production in general means that with U2 across Europe, it's an Irish army on the move. They own their own staging company, European Grid Systems, which also this summer will provide stages for outdoor concerts from Duran Duran to Prince. On the U2 tour, because of the routing of it, we had to uh, supply three of these massive things here. Because the first date was Rome, a day later, a day off I mean, and then the following after that, we were in Modena right now. And uh, next weekend we have to be in Gothenburg in Sweden, so it's impossible to move these particular things that fast. So we, we have three stages of this size, all identical on the tour, and two roofs. So the roofs, of course, can move faster than the stages. They go out after each show on the night. Well, how does everything move? Um, we put them all on, on uh, flatbed trailers. Involved in this, this stage takes up uh, six flatbeds plus one for the roof. So you multiply that then by three times and you see how many trailers we have on the road. It's, it's a, an operation in itself. We have a, a transport manager that looking after this solely for the EGS. For instance, okay, you two have hit the charts, the pop charts all over the world, but they also supposedly hit the seismic charts. <laughs> well, <laughs> we, yeah, it's happened on a few occasions and again, it's just down to environmental conditions, I think, at the time. Uh, the ref on reflection in Rome the other night, there is no technical explanation for why we triggered any seismographs or anything like that because we weren't using any excessive 
wattage or overpowering anything because you know we've got to deal with 50,000 people and that's our main priority and concern is to make sure that they enjoy the show and you know it doesn't interfere with them like so therefore headlines like you two in earthquake night of shame sort of stuff is complete nonsense is it i think it's a bit of um, you know uh, media craziness you know on tour it's quite hectic because obviously there's all the local press to look after, all the people who want to come along and review the show and take photographs for their publications. But in addition to that there's uh, people from countries that we will be visiting in a short while, magazines and newspapers that have longer lead lines than the local people here. And so we have people coming in from cities we'll be in in a couple of weeks time to do something about the show to coincide with the show. And we also have people who are covering tonight's show for tomorrow's papers. too much concentration on a lot of the other aspects of you two besides the music or to the detriment of the music yeah a little bit a little bit in Ireland I mean people are calling it the money tree you know what I mean I mean look at it's like this Dave by the time you pay the road crew by the time uh, don't give me this time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no no the road crew are worth every bit of money no I mean it's just it's all exaggerated all it's all exaggerated all the money the when, when am I getting me wages, brother? <laughs> oh, back to bed, Clayton. The video for I Still Haven't Found What I'm Looking For, tell us about the making of that. Well, uh, it was done very late one night in, uh, in Las Vegas. Barry Devlin, who you know, uh, was in doing a documentary. And uh, we just thought that if we could sort of just have a goof and just see if we could get away with it and do a video, I mean, it wasn't that serious at the time. And uh, just went around the streets of uh, Las Vegas with one camera and uh, uh, had a, what's it called, uh, supermarket basket with the, like a little right. arm yeah. Yeah, and uh, like a little tape recorder and just drive down the road with this. So it was done very, you know, it was just, if it worked it was great, if it didn't there was no problem, it wasn't yeah. gonna break our hearts. So what about being on the road at the moment now? Are you happy? Are things going well? They're going well, but it's, uh, it's a bit difficult to hold on to your head. Is this, <laughs> you have to get someone else to do it for you. <laughs> is it more difficult than it was years ago, or is it easier in some ways? Because No, I think it's more difficult. You know, it's, it's very difficult to um, live up to expectations at this point. And although you have to kind of put that out of your mind and say, well, you just got to get on with it on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah. You, I mean, I think all your relationships are kind of redefining themselves because, you know, it's, it's a bit strange to be held prisoner in a hotel for a couple well, of days. Well, do you think people are putting too much emphasis on the political and the sort of the social awareness side of you two and that? And there should be more emphasis on just the rock and roll of it all. No, I, I don't think so. I mean, I think, I think a lot of the, the, 
people who are sort of hanging outside the hotel uh, are much more interested in, in the emotional identity more so than perhaps any kind of political identity. Yeah. Well, though, what about some other projects then, like the self aid album, you mentioned Maggie's Farm, that's going to have that. Now, you've also done a Christmas album or something, what's that about? Uh, well, it's speculative at the moment, but uh, Jimmy Iovine has been putting together an album of basically all the best Christmas songs that have been around, performed by a number of kind of different artists. And uh, he's found a song for us to do, and we'd like to contribute to it. Um, it's, it's basically to, to help mentally handicapped children and that sort of thing. And I, I think it'd be nice to do something like that at Christmas. And do you think by the time you go back to the States in September the 10th that you'll be number one again, this time with, uh, I still haven't found what I'm looking for? I don't know, but... Uh, Maybe, maybe America's found what it's looking well, for. Well, then, one last one is this. Now, what about the one in Belfast? Surely, because of so few people, that's a lot of money lost. Belfast. We are doing quite a number, about, about 12 or 13 indoor shows around Europe. And they are expensive because, because obviously, our overhead doesn't decrease just because we're playing indoors. And the income you can obtain from a 6,000-seater is much less than from a stadium like this. But the variety of the shows is very important to you too, and different kinds of shows keep you fresh. And playing Belfast outdoors is not possible anyway, there isn't a site. We haven't played Belfast for years, and we were really determined to play the whole country this time. As well as playing Belfast and Croke Park this time round, you two will also be returning to Cork to end the European tour on August the 8th. These are the scenes in Cork in August 85, when you two played a secret unpublicised gig to a surprised and delighted audience of about 7,000 people at Radio 2's Lark by the Lee. You and Cork go back a long way, and you know we broke out of Cork in, in a real sense because we were able to do the Arcadia and all that before uh, we could fill Dublin clubs the same size. So it's nice. It's kind of nostalgic to go back there and do a proper gig after all these years. It's going to be the last one of the second leg of the tour, which is August the eighth. Is that your birthday as well? That's right. Uh, <laughs> have a good, well, en enjoy the party. Well, keep that to yourself. There's no one else remembers. So. We've got press passes, photo passes. Um, TV, radio, everything. Yeah. Okay, well then, Tom, there's one obvious one, right? Because uh, this weekend, uh, the, the, the Crow Park for two days, right? And then the end of the second part of the tour is August the 8th in Cork. Now, tell me, with these here, are you going to have to have 20 times as many as you've got here? We have a completely different system for Ireland. <laughs> everything is different. You couldn't breathe for what we're going to do in Ireland. <laughs> is everybody going to be backstage? Is that it? The whole Everybody's tour? going to try and get backstage. I mean, I've got a hundred first cousins in Cork and they all want to be backstage. <laughs> what am I going to do? So you're going to have to make up some special ones, yeah? Yeah. We're going to have to do something special for Ireland. What, I don't know yet. We're still kind of thinking about it. Every time we come up with a plan that we say, yeah, this is it, it works. We go home, go to bed and wake up the following morning and say, this is, this is all craziness, you know, like there's a lot of things going on, hotels, all sorts of stuff. And when you get back home, so you're free of all that. And this is like the circus, you know, it is like a circus. There's so many people involved, it's all sort of, Everything going on, I just like to get back and just get out of this and just go off my boat and do a bit of fishing and that. That's what I enjoy. I find it's different than the wildness of the American indoor gigs. Yeah, uh, I'm, I am a little nervous. I'm a little nervous about going outdoors. I like it being indoors. Crow Park last time round was the only outdoors gig I was ever at that felt like it was indoors. Yeah. And that's because the Irish crowd just sang every song. 
better than I could sing it. And it's like it's almost it's not up to the band to make it work. It's up to the it's up to the the, the audience, the people at the concert to make it work. That's when I that's our our highest hope for Croke Park and for Cork and for Belfast. This well, particularly the outdoor gigs, is that people make make them feel like they're indoors. to a bunch of yobos from Dublin, you know what I mean? It's a fair play, you know, Kulak, Artane, Ballymun, the poshies from Malahide, you know? <laughs> <laughs> 